right, so welcome back for another midweek with Double Creek. Here we are in week 16 out of 52 weeks in our 52 weeks with Jesus. And so as we continue to move along and we focus on Jesus, we've been looking over the last five weeks in section three at Jesus, the miracle worker. And so during this section of the book, the third section, we are looking at different miracles that were performed by Jesus. And we've seen in looking at these miracles that uh, more people were impacted than just the person who was healed or the person who was provided for or the person who was protected. Others around were impacted as well. Well, today what we're going to be looking at is the great empathizer. Um, so each week, here we're doing this when we do it when we do it at the church, we try to take a guess as far as which miracle we're talking about at this point right here. We get the title of the lesson, The Great Empathizer. We know that it's about a miracle that Jesus performed. Uh, so which one could this be? And this is a tougher one than some of the other weeks, or most of the other weeks as well. Um, but today, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking in Mark chapter 2, uh, the first 12 verses, and we're going to be looking at the miracle when Jesus healed a paralytic. Uh, it's a famous story. Uh, it's a story that really has several different types of lessons that you can learn from it. And so we can't obviously do all of that here in our short midweek time. But I want to go ahead. I want to start off by just reading those first, first 12 verses of Mark chapter 2. It says, And when he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered together, so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there, questioning in their hearts. Why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, he said to them, Why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, Rise, take up your bed and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we've never seen anything like this. And so once again, what we have here is we have another fascinating story of a miracle performed by Jesus. But before we get into this, I want us to just notice a couple of things about uh, this right here that, that Merritt doesn't mention in this chapter in the book. And it kind of goes back to a couple of our midweeks that we've already done during this section on Jesus the Miracle Worker. If you remember from the very first week, we talked about when Jesus performed miracles, maybe why he performed some of them. And I mentioned near the end of that that Jesus always performed miracles so that the God, so that God the Father would be glorified. And we're going to see that today because look at how the last verse finished up there. It tells us that they saw this miracle and they said, we have never seen anything like this. And they were glorified, they were amazed and they glorified God. Now, this seemed to always happen when Jesus performed a miracle. Uh, what I mean by that is those people who were not against Jesus anyway, those people who were not against Jesus, they seemed to always be amazed and glorify God. But also notice here quickly how Jesus is each time when people show great faith to him. Uh, this one kind of reminds me a little bit of last week's when the centurion sent word to Jesus saying, all you have to do is say the word. You don't even have to, don't even come to my house, I'm not worthy. He showed that much faith. He said, and my servant will be healed. But the point I want to make is this, and, and might step on people's toes here, but when there is great faith, Jesus is pleased. I think it's one thing to wait until you have all the money in your bank account and then make a decision and say yes. 
It's something totally different, though, to trust God and let God take over. You see, we, we typically as human beings do that right there, even as Christians. We, we like to wait until we know that we can do it on our own. And then we make a decision and say yes and go ahead and go on with it. Instead of just knowing that something, this right here, can help build God's kingdom. And just making sure that it happens and then letting God take over. I think sometimes we are seriously lacking in faith when it comes to the church across America. And I don't expect everyone to agree with, with that here, maybe not. Uh, but I know I've seen it over and over in the years. Uh, even when churches have plenty of funds, sometimes they want to hold on to it. And, and I've seen some small churches, country churches, especially back home where I'm from, that have money. They have funds set up in their bank. And, and now they're just sitting there with a lot of money in their bank account, but they don't have the people in the church any longer to use it to build God's kingdom. I think sometimes we have to take a step, take a bigger step out more on faith. Anyway, I just wanted to throw that out there today because this has so much to do with faith, uh, this and last week's alone. It's like I said, it's not in marriage chapter, but last week we certainly saw uh, a great deal of faith from the centurion. Uh, today we see a great deal of faith from these four men, and I think it's a faith that is often lacking in Christians all over. Now, with that being said, let's look at this miracle and the faith that took place today. And the first thing Merritt points out is this, a divine excitement. Now, what are some of the things we get excited about in our life? For some people, it might be sports. For someone else, it could be hunting. For someone else, it could be shopping, or maybe for somebody else, it's just going out to eat at a very nice restaurant. For some, there may be quite a few things they get excited about. And when we really stop and think about it, it's hard for us as human beings to imagine God being excited about anything. But God's not just sitting around up in heaven controlling this world with no emotion. He's not just using his power and that's it. God has feelings. God has emotions. And that might sound strange to some people. But God shows love. God shows compassion. God shows joy. We know that, don't we? But he also shows things like anger, jealousy, hate. Now, a lot of Christians will agree with, especially that first part of the list, but hate. Do we see anywhere in the Bible where it says that God hates something? Well, in Proverbs 6, verses 16 and through 19, it says this. There are six things that the Lord hates. Seven that are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that devises wicked plans. Feet that make haste to run to evil. A false witness who breathes out lies. And one who sows discord among brothers. It's hard for some people to imagine or to even understand. But God does have the emotion of hate according to this. He doesn't hate his creation. But he does hate some things that his creation does. And so my point being is that God has emotions. And included in his emotions today is excitement. What kind of things or what is something that would excite God? I truly believe that God is excited when we show great faith. Remember last week how Jesus was marveled. He was amazed at the faith that the centurion had. See, if we show great faith in God, that shows that we trust God. That shows that we believe God. Think about how good it feels when someone has great faith in you, when someone really believes what you say, it feels much better than the opposite, doesn't it? It feels much better than someone choosing not to believe you. Well, here in this story, a paralytic man was brought to Jesus. How this man became that way, I don't know. But we know that there was no way that he was going to get to Jesus unless he had some help. But on this day, he had his chance. I don't know who these four men were, but on this day, he had his chance. The problem was that there was such a big 
crowd gathered around here to hear Jesus in this house, that they were basically blocking every way. Every entryway was blocked. Windows, doors, everything. Even if this man could walk, he couldn't get in to see Jesus. And today's story begins here when Jesus saw an amazing faith once again. And what we see here is that these men had faith to approach Jesus. That's tough for some people to do. Think about how easy Jesus has made it for us to approach him, to come to him. For us, we have to show our faith in Jesus by standing up in front of people we know, maybe coming from the church or doing it on any day of the week or whatever, but confessing him before people, being willing to repent, being baptized. Yet, how difficult is that for some people to do? They're terrified by it somewhat. Now, sure, sure, after we do it, it seems so simple. But how many times are people held back today by something, by fear, by guilt, by some type of pain, by something? Having the faith to come to Jesus is difficult for some people at times. Well, right here in this chapter, in Mark chapter 2, these men, these four men, they knew that the healing teacher had come into town. And not only into town, but he was in public. He was in public and he was uh, teaching the word to people. And they were determined to get their friend in front of Jesus. So what do we read in verse 4? It says, and when they could not get him, when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. I don't care who you are. You have to admire the determination of these men. Even though there was no way for them, they were going to find a way. Even though they could not get in, their faith wouldn't allow them to give up. You know, it's easy to give up sometimes, isn't it? It is. But when we have strong faith, our hope never dies. In the first century, a lot of the roofs, they were made out of things like dried palm leaves combined with clay, and those things would be placed over some beams. So it wasn't extremely difficult to make a hole in a roof like that. So these men climbed from the outside of the house, however they did it, carrying this paralytic. They could have fallen and injured themselves in the process. They could have dropped this man. You know, it could not have been easy getting up on that roof. And even worse, in the eyes of some people, they are about to interrupt Jesus and his teaching. This crowd, they came here so that they could hear Jesus teach, not have Jesus interrupted. But none of this mattered to these men. They saw their opportunity, and they had the faith that Jesus was not only able to, but they had the faith that he would heal their friend. If they didn't have that type of faith, they probably would have stayed home. So they do this. But when they drop him down for Jesus, to Jesus for him to be healed, Jesus does something strange, doesn't he? In that fifth verse we read this. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. So being honest, if we really think about it, at first they maybe felt a little bit let down. Because this is not what they brought him to Jesus for. The man himself, maybe he even felt a bit disappointed. And imagine the owner of this house. He's now going to have to fix this hole in his roof. And then there were those religious leaders. Those hypocrites really in the crowd, you could say. And they weren't happy that Jesus was claiming the authority to be able to forgive sins. That's a lot of different emotions here going on in this one story. But still, these four men, they had the faith to approach Jesus. After all, this was how Merit puts it. It was an unlikely remedy. A remedy is basically a treatment, a cure for some disease or some illness. And what happened is not what they were 
expecting, not what they were even wanting to happen. These men on the roof, they're probably hot, maybe a little bit dirty, maybe sweaty. And at this point, maybe they're wondering why they even just put a hole in another man's roof. As Merritt put it, they carried this man to a healer, but instead they got a preacher. And if you ask the Pharisees there, they wouldn't even call Jesus a preacher at this time. They would have been calling him a blasphemer. Because in their mind, they're asking, who is this guy? Thinking he has the power to forgive sins. And then think about the shift in the emotions of this paralytic. He finally has his chance. After probably years of being a paralytic. He finally has his chance. He's lower down. He has to have some excitement himself. Knowing that his life could be changed in an instant here by Jesus. Only to have Jesus tell him, your sins are forgiven. It really sounds strange. So what's wrong with this picture? Well, nothing's wrong with this picture. Even though it wasn't what they were looking for right then, Jesus knew that this man's greatest problem was not the fact that he couldn't walk. His greatest problem, like all of us, was sin. While his health was one thing and, and it was extremely important, it's something he was extremely, probably most concerned about. Jesus was ultimately concerned with his salvation, with his sin. Jesus knows what the best, that the best thing he could do for this man was to take away his sins. You see, we can be healed of, of, of all kinds of different things. And we can go through life pain-free, happy for a time. But to be free from the bondage of sin... It gives us that hope, doesn't it? He wanted to be healed. But Jesus wanted to save him. And I think sometimes people wonder in our world, like, why is there so much evil in our world? Why is it so wicked? Why is there things like cancer? Why do young children suffer from diseases or die at a young age from some type of sickness? Why is there so much evil in this world? And all we have to do is go back and read the first three chapters of the very first book in the Bible. Because in Genesis chapter 3, we get the story of the fall of mankind, where mankind brought sin into the world. Mankind brought sin into God's perfect world. And ever since then, God has had a great desire to free us from the bondage of sin. Jesus saw the need for that in this man. It was an unlikely remedy. So, God shows his faithfulness. This man was disabled. He couldn't walk. But in reality, sin was the greatest cause of concern. And I'm not saying today that when we sin, God's going to cause us automatically to have some sort of health issue. I'm not saying that in any way. But I'm saying it all goes back, all the problems in this world, they go back to that first sin. Because after that, mankind became cursed, and we face the struggles now of life on a daily basis. But God loves us too much to just leave us that way. See, every problem, every struggle, every illness, every heartache, every pain that we face in life, it's a physical reminder, really, that our greatest need is spiritual, not physical. Because the physical will pass away. Spiritual, that's for eternity. Why is it that so often when people are sick, and maybe even when they're on death's bed, that they reach out to God? Even people who are not Christians sometimes, they will sometimes find themselves reaching out to God. Why? Because they finally reach the point where they realize that's the only hope they have left. It's their only shot. And, and while that's great that they do, God wants us to understand that our greatest need is spiritual, not physical. To be honest, most of the world doesn't understand that. And many of the people in Jesus' day didn't understand that as well. So Jesus knows what these religious leaders were thinking here when he said that to this man. He confronts them. 
And he finally looks at him and he says, but so that, so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and walk. And what did we read in verse 12? And he rose immediately, and he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. They were excited about the physical. And once again, we see God being glorified, as it says there in the last verse. But Jesus, although he was happy to cure him physically, he was more excited about the spiritual. See, Jesus gets excited about changed lives because he is a faithful God. All throughout the scriptures, God never changed. He's always been faithful to his creation. It's his creation that has not always been faithful to him. When you get down to it, Christianity is the only religion that can address our greatest problem, sin, and meets our greatest need, forgiveness. Rising prices in our world. It's not our greatest problem. A struggling economy, not our greatest problem. Taxes being raised on us, not our greatest problem. While those things may affect us all in different ways, our greatest problem is today and has always been as, as a human race, sin. But if our sins have been forgiven, then our hope is secure. And Jesus is preparing a place for us. And, when we re and then we reach that point. We reach that point where we no longer have to fear things like sickness or death. I think Jesus gets excited when we reach that point, when we've given our life to him. In Luke chapter 15, we read, we read a, you can read a parable uh, where a woman lost one of her ten coins and she goes looking for it. When she finds it, Jesus says in the parable that she rejoiced. And then Jesus said this as we finish up in Luke 15, 10. He said, just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. I've read that verse a couple of times here in the last month because we've had a couple of baptisms and, and I think it's just exciting for us to see that we're excited when someone commits their life to Jesus Christ but God and the angels, those in heaven are also excited. God's excited when we step out in faith and trust Him. He is the great empathizer. I want to thank you for joining us here for our midweek this week. I want to close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your many blessings, God. We thank you for uh, your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for uh, these 52 weeks that we're getting to spend here focused on just Jesus. We ask that you watch over us and keep us safe. We pray this in your son's name. Amen.